Right, uh, my name is Peter Griffith and my particular interest in all of this is looking at the carbon footprint in food production but also looking at the concept of creating a carbon label on products which actually represents the carbon usage up until the point that it arrives in a person's hand. The whole subject is a really big subject, but suppose we, we bring it just down to food, which is really your yeah, what I've been area at. of study. How, how could we make a difference there? Is, is, the, is the carbon footprint on food very big re relative to the rest of, the, rest of the, well, the things that we consume? It's about consumerism, really, isn't it? Is it about consumerism? <laughs> yes, it's about consumerism. It's about taking more than you need. About ma is it about manufacturing and travel? If you look at the, the food sector and sort of say, right, what you know, it's about 13 40 percent of your average UK individual's carbon footprint is from food, and so that's the processing of the food, the man, you know, the production of it, the distribution of it, the packaging of it, through to where you actually purchase it. So 40% say of your carbon footprint is directly attributed to food production. If you then sort of say, well, how can you reduce that? How much of that is food miles? How much of that is actual agricultural production? How much of that is packaging? How much of that is uh, you know, the manufacturing process, whatever else? Agriculture itself is about 44% of that. And the reason why it's so high is because there's a lot of methane and nitrous oxide released in the agricultural process rather than carbon dioxide. Remember we were talking earlier that you've got, you know, that methane is 21 times more potent than carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide 310 times. So consequently we've got a system which is releasing those particular greenhouse gases. The carbon footprint will be higher by due to the fact that they're releasing more potent greenhouse gases. The transport element of it is around about 16% of that, of which um, heavy goods vehicles represent about half of it. The rest of it is from traffic itself going to doing the shopping. A lot of the talk has been around reducing f the food miles in order to, to have an effect on this. But in fact, when you've got such a large percentage of that carbon footprint attached to food, is in the actual agricultural production cycle. The food miles is, is not such a big issue. Yes, you want to be buying locally because, you know, there's a possibly a different reason is that you're, you're supporting the local economy rather than because it's going to reduce your footprint. It will have some impact, but it won't have such a big impact as, as changing your diet, actually. Uh, you know, this is the application that you should be vegetarian rather than eating meat because you don't, by being a vegetarian, you're not re releasing methane and nitrous oxide because they are, they're part of the animal production cycle, predominantly, certainly methane. The other argument is that you should be going organic rather than being conventional because conventional ones tend to be using an awful lot of um, fossil fuels in the production of, of the fertilisers and the machinery and the, the intensity of the systems. But if you look at the data behind that, although you will find that the carbon dioxide drops off on a unit, you know, per unit area. So, for instance, um, work done in Northern Ireland comparing organic beef production as opposed to conventional beef production. And when they looked at it, it was a number of kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent released per hectare. For the conventional one, it was something like 530 kilograms per year per hectare, whereas the organic one was 230 kilograms per year per hectare. So an enormous drop there. But when you then look at the actual output, in other words, what is the carbon dioxide equivalent per kilogram of live weight of the bees per year? In the conventional system, it was something like 12.2 kilograms, and then the, the organic one it dropped to 11. So it was only an 8% drop. And this is because in the organic systems, because they are less intense, you don't have the output. And you will find the same in the dairy 
cycle as well. If you've been looking at data for comparing the carbon dioxide, uh, 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 what's the carbon dioxide emissions related to milk production in Western Europe, it looks quite high compared to that of Eastern Europe when you do it on a per unit area per hectare. But when you do it per kilogram of milk produced, it is actually lower in the high intensity Western dairy system than is in the low intensity Eastern European system. But by quite a lot. And again, it's the same thing is that the, the output is so much higher in conventional agriculture. So you have to consider what you're trying to achieve here. So if you're looking at just the your carbon footprint, then going organic or buying local isn't ne doesn't won't necessarily always reduce your carbon footprint. When you're looking at these things too and you're looking at your carbon footprint, bear in mind that a lot of the work, a lot of the figures that they are they are putting into calculating this takes into account what they call a life cycle analysis. So this is where the academia looked at what is the whole life cycle of a particular product from you know the collection of the raw materials into making that through the process of making that particular product and then what happens afterwards, what's gone through in the, the recycling of it, what will happen after it, will it go into a landfill or whatever else. And they, have, they come up then with a carbon footprint for a particular product over its whole life cycle. Now that's all very well when you're looking at this from a sort of government level or global level as to what the effect will be of doing these things, but as an individual you don't want to be looking at the life cycle analysis of a particular product. What you want to be looking at is what is the carbon dioxide equivalent footprint attached to that particular product up until the time it arrives in your hand. Say if you've got a fridge that you've bought, right, and and you say, I want to calculate my carbon footprint. I just bought this fridge. It's so many kilograms of carbon dioxide as a result of buying that fridge. But that's based on its life cycle analysis, which is saying that it's only got a five-year life cycle with you, and then you're going to stick it into a landfill. Well, if you keep that for ten years, or fifteen years, or you or whatever, and you don't put it into a landfill, then that figure that's been attached to it by the life cycle analysis is no longer valid. So in a way when we're looking at carbon footprints really you should be calculating it on what has happened up until the point that it arrives in your hand. That's all you want to know because then you maintain responsibility for what happens afterwards. If you're given a figure attached to it which is include, includes what will happen to it afterwards, it takes away your individual responsibilities to what to do with it.